normal to what we, we were supposed to have a, a break, which we're not going to have this time round. Uh, and I'm going, I'm very happy to actually introduce the last speaker of this section. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Marius Stan. So Marius is a, a scientific consultant with expertise in multi-scale modeling and AI. Before retiring last year, he was a senior scientist and leader of uh, intelligent material design in the Applied Materials Division at Argonne National Laboratory, as well as uh, a senior fellow at University of Chicago and Northwestern University. So Marius and his group has been using AI and high performance uh, multi-scale computer simulations to understand and predict physical and chemical properties of complex systems. Uh, both for energy production, energy storage, electronics, and a number of applications like national security as well. So the group also used uh, AI to optimize complex manufacturing process, such as 3D printing and uh, flame spray py uh, py pyrolysis. Marius has extensively published in the scientific literature, holds several patents, and is um, even currently working uh, on a book on modeling and simulation. So. Uh, very happy to have him here. Uh, today, uh, today's title for his talk is a recent advancement in artificial intelligence and the impact on tribology. Please, Marius, go ahead. And thank you for having waiting longer than you would have wanted. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, just want to make sure that you can hear me well. Is that well enough? Okay. So I'll go on with sharing the screen. All right, do you see my first slide? Everything okay? All right, so when Norbert uh, and I first uh, interacted about uh, this conference, uh, uh, we had some back and forth messages and in the end converged towards uh, this idea of discussing a bit more about uh, the history and the progress in artificial intelligence and then uh, giving some examples from the work in our group at Argonne and at uh, Northwestern in University of Chicago. And I will end with uh, uh, considerations about the impact on tribology, although I'm not a, an expert in that field, I rely on your participation and help in seeing if elements of artificial intelligence can be used and can make a positive impact on tribology. Let me see if I can uh, also have, yeah, I will, I will just stop here. So a brief history of artificial intelligence. This is uh, part of the book uh, that was mentioned. Uh, I'm under contract to write a book on human uh, and artificial intelligence, and this is going to be a section in that book. Of course, uh, uh, just to spark your interest, uh, I'll, I'll give you some elements of the, the way I perceive the evolution of this uh, technology. And it's maybe a bit, it's older than you may think. Uh, what uh, many consider the start of AI is in fact a paper by Alan Turing from 1950, in which he posed the question, can machines think? He estimated that the answer to this question will come in maybe five decades. And uh, he was off by uh, 15 years or so, you'll see. Uh, at the time, Turing was working at the National Physics Laboratory in uh, uh, UK. If you've seen the movie, The Imitation Game, uh, the story of the Enigma machine, the way they uh, deciphered uh, uh, the communication, encrypted communication, that the Germans used during the war. What might be an even bigger surprise, it was for me, however, when I researched this field, is that shortly after, 1952, 1957, two concepts that are familiar to us, and you've heard them mentioned in the previous talks, uh, machine learning and neural networks, have been proposed. So these are not new developments. We are not in the midst of a new area of technology or of algorithmic development. Uh, it's just that for a while, uh, the artificial intelligence research field 
went through what is referred as uh, the winter of AI. It practically froze. Uh, the programs stopped. There was less interest, less funding. And I, why do you think that was? If I, uh, when I give this uh, talk uh, uh, live, I usually interact with the audience and say, why, what are your opinions? And people, uh, your opinions? And people come up with answers like, oh, there was no internet, there was no Google. There, was, there were not that many powerful machines, computational machines, uh, that could help. Uh, I do think that one of the main reasons was uh, the overconfidence that the researchers who worked in that area had in their technology and the fact that they overstated the power of artificial intelligence. You will see ads uh, and uh, headlines saying uh, robots uh, will uh, clean your kitchen, will take your children to school, will do this and that, and it just didn't happen. So I will take away from this uh, the fact that Myself, first of all, but all of us, maybe as a community, should be careful with proposing the impact and the advantages of artificial intelligence in any field. We should be a, more, a bit more cautious. Now, 1997 marked uh, a turning point in, in uh, the attitude uh, the, the way the uh, public embraced artificial intelligence because it came as a shock that a computer defeated the world chess champion, Kasparov. Uh, that was uh, really uh, a shock for, for the human uh, chess players, which was maybe doubled by the fact that, uh, or enhanced by the fact that more recently AlphaGo also defeated the human Go champion recently. In between, we have a number of developments, the Watson machine at ABM, the personal assistants, many of you are using Siri, Cortana, or Google, Alexa, and things like that. Now, here is a 2014 uh, uh, moment when Eugene Gossman, which was a software developed by a Russian and an Ukrainian uh, uh, and a team, uh, managed to pass the Turing test. It was, you see, 64 years after uh, the prediction made by Turing that it will take uh, half a century for a machine to appear to behave and carry a conversation as if it was uh, a human. So what's gonna happen next? So I'm taking a risk here, and uh, some of you will uh, hold me accountable, no doubt, uh, saying that, uh, by saying that we will have, by 2025, proof that intelligent software is able to contribute decisively to scientific discoveries and technology developments. And furthermore, I make the prediction that by 2035, we will add a piece of software, a program, as a co-author on a publication. And I have reasons, and I can demonstrate that there is a good chance that this will happen. And we can talk about that if you are interested uh, at some point. Now, um, just briefly, some of the, the, the recent developments in this technology before going to examples in material science and tribology. Uh, one of the most spectacular ones, perhaps, is the fact that uh, in several cities across the United States, uh, Los Angeles is one of them, uh, even on the East Coast, uh, we can have uh, Las Vegas, we can have self-driving machines. Uh, Various companies are involved in, in uh, developing this technology. They can pick you up from home and take you to the airport and bring you back. Uh, I'm not sure I never uh, travel in one of them if they do small talk or carry a conversation or anything uh, along the way, but definitely it's quite impressive. And of course, there have been problems. There have been a few accidents, some of them quite severe, but human drivers make mistakes too, right? Um, 
here's another example where um, a certain type of uh, machine learning algorithm based on the reinforcement learning is able to uh, play games of uh, high complexity and win almost all the time. So if anybody plays uh, online, like my son does, uh, with people around the world and uh, loses all the time, <laughs> it's because maybe at the other end there is no, I don't know, Jim Johnson from Kentucky, but uh, actually a robot or a, a bot uh, a software that is able to use this type of technology, uh, including uh, guns, generative adversarial uh, networks, and win at the games. The, the applications go beyond materials, go beyond uh, uh, physics and chemistry. Uh, I believe these uh, 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 very intelligent uh, uh, pieces of software are able to win now even in strategic situations such as war, actual wars, or conflicts between uh, in, uh, inside society. And um, another one that I found too spectacular too, uh, uh, just a few years ago in Japan, uh, a computer was able to propose to submit a novel to a contest uh, without mentioning that this was not written by a human but by a machine and passed the first round of screening. Nobody realized uh, it was not a human author. However, it didn't win, it didn't even make it to the final. But to me, it's significant, uh, especially in light of the Turing test, that uh, the members of the reviewing committee thought for a while that it was uh, a text of uh, a good enough quality to be promoted to the next round. So just a few other things uh, that may or may not impact uh, your research field in tribology. Uh, robots. I assume there are uh, areas in tribology where robots are being used, quite sophisticated devices that are far from what we've seen in the past. Uh, they can move uh, easily, they can uh, react properly when pushed around, when tripped, find their balance, can recognize objects, find their way in uh, various environments. Here's another one. We had a project at Argonne National Laboratory where a swarm of drones was used to supervise uh, events, uh, was flying uh, above uh, the Soldiers Field Stadium here in downtown Chicago and looked for uh, potential fires that might jeopardize the safety of, of the people uh, in the stadium, or for conflicts, uh, like, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, scuffles, or uh, somebody starting a fight uh, uh, that required the intervention of, uh, of the security uh, uh, of the stadium. And I, let me tell you that they were, uh, the, uh, the drones were far better at identifying fires than um, uh, human conflicts. Whenever somebody would trip with a Coca-Cola uh, and spill Coca-Cola down the stairs, they, will, they tended to say, oh, there is something happening and we need to call security. Uh, last example is a robotic school of fish. Uh, where each member of this team, let's call it a team, was able not only to analyze uh, the environment at very, uh, in, in very, very far from, uh, from their base, their home, but also communicate with other team members and make decisions in an autonomous way. Uh, they will examine the environment, decide if they need to go farther and explore more or withdraw if they need a light or not to save energy battery. There was no contact between the school of fish and, their, and the research team until they returned. And when they returned, they uh, uh, provided a, a report, a comprehensive re report of what they found. Now, you may imagine applications, various applications of all these aspects of artificial intelligence, but Let's slowly return to the, to the topic, the main topic of this meeting, of this conference. And I would say that we, we should 
think for a moment uh, at the advantages and the drawbacks of this technology. And I, I'm putting this up front in the spirit that I mentioned that we should not overstate the power of artificial intelligence. It's true that it can process data at higher speed, higher volume, even a higher variety of, of data uh, types, far better than a human. It can work all day long, 24 hours a day, never gets tired, never gets uh, moody. That's also interesting. Uh, interesting. It's a cold, effective, efficient partner in any research activity. There are, however, some drawbacks that have been pointed out. And then we have uh, the believers. Uh, maybe it's not a coincidence that the believers in AI are also CEOs or CDOs of large companies that create AI software. And the skeptics, such as Elon Musk or Stephen Hawking, who warned the community that there might be dangers associated with developing this technology. Now, I suggest to embrace the positive aspects and the power of artificial intelligence. And to convince you that there is a good path forward, I'll give some examples. First of all, this has been presented in previous talks by Luca and, and others. Um, artificial intelligence is a complex technology. What I would like to, to emphasize is that it is far, goes far beyond machine learning. Uh, I never use, it's just a preference, AI slash ML. Machine learning is an important, a key component of artificial intelligence, but it's not the only one. Um, as you will see in the examples <clears throat> I uh, will present, computer vision is important, robotics, natural language processing that has been mentioned uh, in a recent presentation. And then, of course, uh, 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 Machine learning uh, is nested in AI, and so is deep learning, algorithms based on natural uh, networks, a part of machine learning, as it was pointed out. So instead of uh, uh, discussing in more detail uh, this structure, I will give some examples, especially in the area of using different classes of algorithms in machine learning, computer vision, and a little bit about natural, uh, natural language processing. So first I invite you, and here we are going to put our technology to test and the broadband uh, we have. Uh, I invite you to examine uh, the video clip of a candle and tell me if you can see the flame changing, right? Everybody does? Is that okay? No. You may not uh, believe this, but our project started with the analysis of this image. Uh, we were wondering uh, what goes through a human's mind when looking at this video, the clip. How do we make this determination that, for example, at the very beginning, the flame was stable, somewhere in the middle, it became unstable, and at the end, was stable again. I confess that I don't know exactly how I do that. I guess everybody who looks at that video clip can make the similar statement. Stable, then unstable, then stable again. How do we do that? I got no training in uh, flame stability, but somehow, based on my life experience, I can make such a determination. Now, if we go to flame spray paralysis, a technology that involves putting chemicals in a flame and obtaining a powder with specific properties. I'm simplifying that too much, but I think it's enough to, to, to get the point. If we would look at, as humans at the stability of these uh, highly sophisticated devices and flames, it's not going to be that easy for us to make similar determinations. So the question was, can we develop the software? And not only a software, but also can we couple it with uh, a high-quality camera and analyze flames in a way similar to the one the technologists do? 
And can we do that with such detail and confidence in the result that maybe the software can help the technologies and maybe even take over some of the tasks that the technologists have. So the advantage of that would be that instead of having a human supervising these flames all day long or in shifts, three shifts of eight hours, we can have the software coupled to the camera make these determinations and maybe trigger messages to the technologist and say, hey, your flame is unstable or is going almost extinct. We need to do something. Can you do something? Or in the near future, trust the software with taking action, restoring the system to the normal operating system. Now we did such an experiment. We used a large number of uh, uh, video clips and images. And first of all, asked uh, experts, human experts, uh, at Argonne National Laboratory at Princeton University and uh, uh, at the local universities in Chicago to examine the video clips and uh, tell us which ones they thought were stable, which ones they thought were unstable, and when was it that they could not make a determination. It was unclear, uncertain. And then trained using supervised learning, a class of algorithms, that operates most of the time on labeled data in the sense that we know what the features are, uh, the algorithm is aware of certain characteristics of the system is supposed to examine. We used approximately 80% of the data for training and uh, the rest for uh, making predictions, video clips, images that have not been used in the training. Uh, for those who are interested, I, uh, in, at the bottom of each slide, I have a reference to a paper that one of the several papers that is relevant to this experiment where you can find uh, more information. But uh, at the core, this was based on uh, uh, region-based convolutional neural networks uh, as available in TensorFlow. And now I hope you can see how these algorithms operate. And of course, the question is, is it the same as humans do? When I look at such flame, what goes through my mind? Uh, do I look at the length of the width of the color of the, the intensity of the light? What is this algorithm operating? Is it operating the same way as my mind does? That was an interesting question, I would say, which was not uh, answered yet. Then we decided to use a different class of machine learning algorithms for clustering. This would be unsupervised learning. And in preparation of that, we used uh, uh, a principal component analysis to reduce the space from over 40,000 data points or coordinates to just two principal components. For those of you who are interested, we also looked at three and more, but determined that two principal components are sufficient. In this representation, various video clips appear in what to a human would be several clusters. Uh, some of them in the upper right, upper left part, some in the bottom, others are uh, in the uh, lower and upper right part. And then we ask the, the algorithm to group them, to cluster it, to propose the regions where the algorithm considered that one can group the stable flames, the unstable, and the uncertain ones. You see, this is unlabeled in the sense that the algorithm doesn't know and doesn't care what these points represent. It's just interested in grouping them. It starts with a centroid, which is a black point, which maybe you cannot see, but somewhere in here for each area, and then goes around, uh, uh, brings in the points that are nearest to the centroid and continues this process until it forms and proposes three clusters. And now I'm gonna uh, pause a little bit and say, and ask you to, to, to think and estimate how good 
how well the two algorithms, supervised learning and unsupervised learning, did in predicting the stability of the flames compared to the humans. Was it the, the supervised one with the data label and all the features of the flame, or the unsupervised one, which required far less training, but was quicker? And here is a result. Again, a publication listed down at the bottom of the, uh, of the slide. I, I hope it matched your expectations. If we assign the ground truth to humans' evaluation, uh, we think humans are always right, and maybe they are, maybe we are. Uh, the supervised learning algorithm uh, made predictions that were consistent with the humans' evaluations up to 90, over 90%. Really good. But then remember, we had to train it for uh, maybe a couple of weeks on hundreds of video clips and images. We had to label those. We had to uh, give uh, examples and counter examples for stability and instability of the flames. We did a lot of work to, to make this algorithm make predictions that are so good. The unsupervised learning method, the clustering one, uh, did well too, 73.6%. I, I would say that's not bad at all. And of course, the question came up, uh, when is it worth to put a lot of effort in training a complex algorithm of any kind, but a machine learning one in particular, to gain high precision and accuracy. And in what situations we can live with an algorithm that is quicker, doesn't require so much training, but makes good predictions nevertheless. So that's something to, to think about. And uh, uh, I guess for each project, for each application, there will always be a, a choice. Uh, regarding the type of algorithm that's most beneficial in terms of the time, the effort, the energy, the funding, the uh, team that one is willing to put forward to, to address, to make good models and predictions. Now we do have uh, a good result, good news to share with you. This is the control panel of that experiment, flame spray pyrolysis. Uh, and uh, I'm going to run a recording of what was at the time a live broadcast of the way this intelligent software controls the entire process. You will see in the lower left part uh, uh, the actual image uh, coming from the, uh, the burner, the flame, You'll see uh, various uh, control elements, temperature, oxygen level. On the upper right, we have uh, that blue dotted line, uh, the distribution of particles in the powder, which is the, the end result uh, of this uh, chemical process. Uh, and other information that may not be uh, so relevant for this discussion. I, I'm just want to, I'm showing this just to demonstrate that it is possible to have a software that analyzes somehow through vision, memorization, decision-making, learning, a rather complex and dangerous. It's chemistry at high temperature, chemicals in the flame, methane, explosives, and it does it with uh, such, uh, such good results that the technologist is now using this software to uh, restore uh, the process to normal conditions, to even design experiments and create powders of a specific um, uh, distribution and so on. So I imagine that one day uh, there will be a, a manufacturing plant that maybe uses uh, 200 such experimental setups, and there is an intelligent software that monitors all of them and takes corrective actions, even in the most difficult situation. 
Uh, this is a team of researchers. They are humans after all. No code, no software can do anything meaningful by itself at this time. Uh, we have chemists, we have mathematicians, data analysis specialists, CFD uh, experts, and we had a student from Princeton three years ago who spent three months with us. Uh, the student um, did so well in proposing sub, uh, uh, elements of the project, analyzing the data, writing code, running the code, that not only that we decided to add her as a co-author of the paper, but she is the main or the first author of this paper, which is quite something, I would say, for a junior undergrad, right? Uh, and I'm telling you, we thought long and hard if we should include as a co-author the code itself, the Python code that we wrote to accomplish all these elements, and decided not to for the reason that the code displayed uh, intelligence, a lot of knowledge, energy, but no elements of creativity. We didn't get any new idea, any great uh, suggestion for the path forward from this software. But I'm confident that not long from now, a piece of software will become the co-author of a paper. And it could be my estimation in the area of discovering materials with spectacular properties that humans have been searching for for a long time and haven't been able to, to find. Okay, so briefly another example just to illustrate that uh, AI can be used not only for, uh, for optimizing in real time complex synthesis, manufacturing processes, but also for discovering uh, new materials for improving, for screening uh, compositions and structures to create materials with better properties. This is an example uh, not related to tribology, but I would say that a similar approach could be used to optimize properties that are key to tribology projects and experiments. In this case, uh, uh, we were looking at hafnia, hafnium oxide, uh, for the purpose of improving the performance of uh, uh, memory in, uh, in computers. And here is uh, one slide that is really busy, but it's a condensed uh, uh, information bucket, if you want, uh, that one can, can uh, use to understand the process. Uh, this was uh, in collaboration with Gabor Chani that was mentioned by Luca at the very beginning of the session. Uh, indeed, we worked with him on using uh, machine learning to improve the interatomic potentials. But the machine learning played uh, a larger role here. Uh, we also uh, coupled machine learning with Bayesian analysis and uh, made determinations regarding the uncertainty of various properties of this material. Uh, furthermore, we used active learning to uh, optimize the investigation, the screening of the space, property space, uh, in real time. As you can tell, there are both the, uh, uh, the supervised machine learning as it relates to regression was used to create optimal models that link, uh, for example, density and uh, other properties to temperature and the composition, but also unsupervised machine clustering algorithms that help us ad identify the regions of the hyperspace that uh, are associated with the best properties. Again, I invite you to read the, the paper if you have the time uh, uh, in FISREF letters, also in the uh, Nature Partner Journal uh, dedicated to computational material science. It has been mentioned several times that AI can also help accelerate uh, uh, computational uh, computer simulations, which was the case here, quite a spectacular acceleration. We managed to do a hundred times better than classical DFT with similar accuracy. This is not, I mean, it's not two times, five times, it's a hundred times better 
uh, in the area of uh, uh, optimizing the interatomic potentials. Uh, 20 years ago, I would do that by hand uh, using uh, modified embedded atom methods and so on, and it, it would be a couple of months for Mike Vasquez and I to use our knowledge and some black magic to determine the, the optimal interatomic potential. Now one can do that in a couple of days, sometimes in, even in a few hours. This is spectacular, uh, reducing the human time and effort necessary to optimize uh, force fields, interatomic potentials for DFT, for molecular dynamics and so on. So this resulted in a, in a better uh, uh, material for computer memories. Now I'm gonna wrap up by mentioning uh, what I found uh, while researching for applications of artificial intelligence to tribology. I'm no expert, I will let you judge the value of these, but I thought to give, uh, I thought of giving uh, uh, just a couple of examples. One of them is uh, designing uh, uh, polyethylene composites using elements of artificial intelligence. This must be an important uh, project, not for me to judge. What I liked about this project in particular was the way they used the deep learning coupled with genetic algorithms to create uh, 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 relationships between Young's models and the tensile strength that are optimal for that particular application. No one can do this by trial and error or cook and look as I used to do decades ago try different compositions. In the case of composites, try different orientations, different ratios between uh, the components until we find an optimal relationship between young modules and uh, tensile strength. But the help that, the, that AI provided can, cannot be uh, neglected. They were able to do this quicker in a more comprehensive way. And the result was an actual improvement in the properties of that composite material. So I thought that that, that was a good example of how AI can, can help in this area. And here's a, a representation, a diagram that shows how similar these approaches can be. If you remember in, a, in what I showed you about the splitting fray paralysis, we will use experimental information and uh, uh, computational results, uh, synthetic data from DFT molecular dynamics and so on, and then had an integrator, if you had an engine that used machine learning uh, and computer vision and natural language processes to optimize the, the whole process. Uh, one can use supervised or unsupervised learning for classification, regression, clustering. Now the parameters they give here as example in the input training data solid properties, surface properties, lubricant, uh, as well as in the output training, film thickness, friction, are examples from this work that I'm referencing. But I invite you to think of your particular project in the area of tribology and say, oh, what, I, what would I put in this box here? What would be my input properties and training data sets? What am I gonna collect from experiment and what's the output that I care about, the parameters that I care about? And is there anything specific that we could list in this central box that will help optimize the entire system? Something that will work in particular for a project that you are interested in. And if you feel like that you, 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 it would be good, useful to discuss about how to set up this environment for your particular projects, let me know. Again, I may not know much about tribology, but I do have some experience with creating methodologies like this one that involve elements of artificial intelligence and multi-scale simulation methods. Now, if you think that's interesting enough, Shoot me an email at mariusstan365 at gmail.com. That's my address uh, here in Chicago. Uh, and we can talk about many, many things. Uh, some of the ones that I mentioned uh, that 
AI is in fact uh, a technology that has been around for a long time with more or less success and it's more than machine learning. That we have various classes of algorithms that one can use and each of them has its strength and weakness in addressing specific mathematical problems but also physics or chemistry uh, projects. I am very proud to report a restate that we had created a program that is intelligent enough to assist the technologies in controlling in real time a complex chemical synthesis and maybe even can be entrusted with running that process by itself. And the fact that we can use AI, elements of AI, again, not only machine learning, uh, to uh, explore uh, various structures, various compositions, various temperature, pressure fields, and create, discover and create, design better materials. That's, I think, something that cannot be neglected. No, uh, I didn't know what to say useful and meaningful for tribology. I'm just expressing my hope that the community will embrace some elements of AI and combine them, couple them with what is already existing in matter, in experiment and uh, uh, computation in, and make it such that it, it's a, uh, how should I say, it enhances uh, what you, uh, you are doing right now. AI is not a competitor. I don't see it as a danger. On the contrary, I think it's a technology that can make our science and technology and our life better. So I uh, thank you for your attention and I'll answer any questions and address any comments you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marius. That was very, very, very interesting. Um, personally, I learned a lot, uh, not be directly in the field of AI. Um, are there any questions in the chat or by the audience or by the organizers. So I don't see any questions in the chat so far. Uh, I do have a question, however, which I might ask. Uh, so very nice talk, I agree. Um, but uh, uh, the question about uh, uh, an AI or some some kind of software co-authoring a paper. I mean, I I know that there are several people co-authoring papers that probably should not be co-authoring papers. If you look at uh, the divi uh, different definitions that you know journals and scientific uh, institutions um, have, let's say, as, uh, as measurements who should be on a paper and not. But uh, I mean, if you, if you put in an, an artificial intelligence, then you should put as an author every other software you use that is a little bit more complex, right? I mean, uh, as, as long as, and maybe I'm, I'm missing the point here, but as long as you don't have any really creative input, it's, isn't it just a tool like any other? No, uh, maybe a clarification is required. Of course, anybody can add the name of a code as a co-author and submit to a journal. There is nothing preventing you doing that other than maybe some uh, restrictions at your company or university or say you cannot add anybody in, on the publications. But what I'm referring to is a situation where uh, such a paper passes the review, a peer review. And uh, the software is considered truly as a meaningful contributor, contributor to that research uh, on the same foot with the human participants. So uh, I see that possible because as you mentioned, uh, one judges the contribution of each author of a publication and uh, we cannot have absolutely equal contributions from everybody. Some do more, some less, there are different areas there. And I, I see uh, uh, the fact that uh, the moment uh, AI codes demonstrate creativity, which to me is the ability of finding a new solution to a problem, something original that hasn't been thought out by anybody. That moment, we could add it. The way it is right now, 
the fact that it helps uh, analyzing large bodies of data, the fact that it helps us uh, do things faster, is not sufficient. It's not enough. But I see as a possibility that uh, in a few years, a program will demonstrate the fact that it can discover, as I said, a new material or propose an original idea for improving a technology that should the entity be a human, we would not hesitate in adding that entity to the paper. But because it's a program, we can struggle. Uh, I hope I hope I explained a little bit, because otherwise there are people who did uh, funny experiments. They added the name of their cat to a paper and submitted to a journal, and that was rejected, and so on. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the meaningful contribution that we will all agree it's important enough to warrant uh, co-authoring a paper, a journal. Yeah, I think that that was exactly the clarification I was looking for. Um, the point that the creativity is needed. That uh, maybe I miss misheard in the, in the first part. And by the way, I, I just saw that uh, Nick and Ilya had to leave uh, because they have another meeting, so I again apologize for... Uh, well, it's really... Th thank you, Marius, for his uh, encouraging perspective he's saying in the chat, which is actually what I, how I feel as well. Um, Maybe I have a quick a quick curiosity. I don't know if I missed that or I, I just um, so when you were talking about uh, humans versus supervised versus uh, unsupervised, were those uh, trained humans? Can so the you... human uh, the, the regarding the part that you were discussing uh, describing about the flame, and you yeah. were saying that you compared human versus unsupervised learning and supervised learning and supervised learning i was wondering if the human part was a trained human or it was uh, no so we had 11 experts of all ages uh, students uh, professors uh, scientists uh, uh, all of them uh, with some understanding of combustion Right, mm -hmm. I'm a physicist and a chemist. My PhD is in chem I understand combustion. So none of us was an uh, expert, for example, in the computational fluid dynamics of uh, of these. So we were more interested in their gut reaction, their instinct, mm -hmm. what did they think, without asking them to do a similar analysis. So there were no instructions given. For example, okay. look at the intensity, look at the color, look at this and that. So, uh, yeah, so the answer is they did not go through a specific uh, training. That might have biased their... Uh, some exactly. bias, yeah, some, uh, in, in some direction. But maybe they counter um, balance each other depending on what kind of uh, education or experience they might Correct. have had. That, that is... Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the, for the interruption. Um, who else has questions for Marius? Someone else? I might have one last one, last curiosity if we have time or if you guys want to go. I have one last uh, DFT oriented because I am a DFT person and every time I hear that then I tend to. Uh, ask myself. So in the paper with, the, I guess this is Gabor, in the paper with Gabor, you mentioned briefly that you found a similar accuracy as DFT. Can you be a little bit more uh, specific for a similar and what DFT? Right. So we were looking at uh, uh, using machine learning to create uh, an interatomic potential that has uh, a, a quality uh, that is similar to the ones that uh, are being used currently in DFT for hafnium oxide, for example. Okay, and for specific. At, uh, specific. And looked at properties uh, such as uh, uh, energy of formation, the cohesive energy. We looked at uh, uh, evaluating the lattice parameters predicted, equilibrium uh, lattice predicted by the two. So during that comparison, we thought that, okay, the results are similar enough in terms of EV per atom in terms of action. Mm -hmm. uh, and here is where I'm placing uh, uh, similar accuracy and uh, uh, confidence in the result. Uh, and then we found that, as I said, it took us far less time to reach these type of results 
that we're using in this comparison. Yeah. Uh, if we think of how long it took to various uh, research teams to propose interatomic potentials for hafnia. So that that was the basis for the yeah. for the, for uh, for the statement. Can we produce similar results with the same accuracy and precision using this technology? Wow. No, I'm just going to add that there there might be, and this goes to all the talks before. Uh, one of the thing with machine learning is that uh, is not fully understandable is not fully transparent how these algorithms work. And we often don't get any explicit analytical relationship between the input and the output. It just works amazingly well. In some sense, it's a black box. And uh, to me, it's a return to empiricism. And here's another question for anybody in science. Do you care about understanding the physics, the chemistry, the fundamental laws of the nature, or it's more important to get an accurate result quickly. So I'm a physicist and a chemist by training. It pains me to acknowledge that often, I don't know why the code I wrote performs so well and what's behind that. And how can I relate that to uh, the fundamental laws of science? And it's a conundrum. I, I don't know what to say more about this. It, it, it's something that I struggle with. Maybe others have resolved this issue. Well, that's something to think on, especially if we if one starts to incorporate these tools more and more in its own research or her own research, we're going to uh, find ourselves having to make a decision on how to how we feel about this. I guess. Indeed. So to your, to your comment before, if you have a Leonard, George, Leonard Jones in the atomic potential, you know what every coefficient means or everything. Yeah. Means. If you have a prediction made by the machine learned in the atomic potential is as accurate and precise, but we don't have any explicit form. We don't know what goes in that, what's, how mm -hmm. that relates to the physics, to the interactions. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, Thank you very much for everyone who participated to this session, from Marius and all of the speakers that were here. So I would give a, one more uh, virtual round of applause as Norbert has already done. Um, I just want to conclude by saying that we're going to continue our seminars uh, on the 10th of October, where we have our next uh, session. On, those, on that day, we have uh, Maria Clelia Righi uh, from Bologna, and we have uh, Noah Maram from Carnegie Mellon University in the US. Um, and I feel very good about the session we have today because our intent was to start introducing the main uh, tools and advances in machine learning and uh, AI and big data environment, like um, uh, subjects and um, and, and so this was a good way to start off with the with this uh, with this web seminars. Now the idea is that maybe we all have much more understanding of these tools. And in the next uh, seminars, we're going to have a, a more tribology oriented applications of the very tools we have discussed today that Luca and Marius have so brilliantly sort of uh, tell us, told us about. Hope you enjoyed uh, the talks today, and um, I hope. I will see you on the 10th of October and then on the 14th as well.